This world will burn if he has not stopped. We'll protect the kingdom together.
Happy Thursday, everybody. Welcome to Chair League Division 3 action. Today we have the War Boys currently sitting at 1 and 5 versus the Jackson 5 currently sitting at 2 and 5. Uh, War Boys started their season off on a little bit of a losing streak, but they got their first win two weeks ago, trying to make it 2 out of 3 going into this week. Jackson 5 have lost two straight and looking to uh, right the ship here. Uh, all of the Division 3 maps this week will be on Tomb of the Spider Queen. We do have uh, both of the draft links out already, so uh, we should get this game going here fairly soon, little to no wait. A little bit about myself, uh, my name is Mongoose, uh, if you want to tweet at me, my Twitter handle is right below my face here. I play on a Division 1 team called The Leftovers, and uh, I've tried to really start focusing on casting uh, Division 2 and 3 teams because I know when I look for casters I want them to hopefully help me improve my game and I think that would be who I have the most to offer to, so that's why I'm really trying to focus on the lower division games. Uh, my team has played scrimmed against every level, Division 2, 3, 1, and Pro Division, um, as well as some really good amateur teams in, in Divergent tournaments, hero type tournaments. So um, I have a lot of amateur competitive experience to draw from that I hopefully can impart onto you guys. And the players, when you rewatch this uh, or a game, which I know you will, please send me feedback on Chair League or Twitter. I love feedback. So uh, War Boys had the first pick, first ban. Uh, Kael'thas doesn't really get through ever right now, so he was banned. Zagara banned out by Jackson 5. She's really good on this map. If you spread the creep properly, you can almost see both of the turn ends all the time and really allows you to control the map. Zul is probably the most powerful character on this map. I believe his hot slogs win rate on this map is something like 60%. So that's a really good pick by the uh, War Boys. He's really powerful on this map because he pushes so hard. Jackson 5 have picked their support first, Rhaegar. I think Rhaegar is the most powerful support in the game. He's just a little bit ahead of the others. Uh, he has the best wave clear of any of the supports, possibly uh, with the exception of Brightwing. So Rhaegar is always a good selection. He fits into all kinds of different comps. Uh, and Sylvanas also is another good pusher for this map. So uh, really leaving themselves a lot of flexibility, not really tipping their hand to Jackson 5. And Warboys, no hesitation, scooped up Leeming and Johanna. Leeming and Zul pair really well together. Um, if Zul gets his Bone Prism uh, locked in, it's just a stationary target for Leeming to hit her combos on. So those two pair together really well, and Leeming gets her most value out of getting her resets with kills. Zul really helps her with that, especially if he selects the vulnerability on the Bone Prism targets. Uh, Johanna is also an excellent selection on this map in particular. If you go a Condemn build with uh, Eternal Retaliation, I think it is at level 4, uh, Johanna has the best wave clear of any of the primary tanks in the game. And on Tomb, uh, that's really good. So I really like Warboy's draft so far. Jackson 5 respond with the uh, Brightwing ban. And Warboy's come back trying to isolate the tank role with the Muradin ban. I'm very curious what the Jackson 5 is going to do here with this pick. The Brightwing ban to me was a little bit curious. I'm, I'm wondering if they're, uh, if it was a targeted ban and that they're trying to select a character that Brightwing counters, so they wanted her off the board. Um, Illidan does go very well uh, with Rhaegar, although Zul's a pretty hard counter to Illidan with his uh, root and his uh, attack speed slow, so we'll see what the Jackson 5 decides to do. I do really like what Warboys has going so far. They, uh, there you go. Okay, so Jackson 5 picking their primary tank in Diablo. And still uh, have one more pick before the Warboys get to select their last two heroes. Uh, Diablo, people have had mixed feelings since his uh, rework with the Shadow Charge. Some people like it. I've, I've heard more people don't because it... It uh, makes it more difficult to use his Shadow Charge for peeling because he gets carried with them, so it doesn't give him any space from uh, his target of a Shadow Charge. However, it does make it much easier to set up his backflip. Thirty seconds left for the Jackson 5 for the second selection. Really considering their options here, 
Um, they do need a primary damage dealer still, um, and they need to decide whether they're going to get a second frontliner. Thrall would be a good selection here because of his wave clear. Jaina is a good selection too. Um, she pairs really well with uh, APOC if you can use either the APOC to set up the Ring of Frost is not bad. Jaina seems to be slowly working her way back in the meta. Warboys respond really quickly with the Tyrande Malfurion double support. So I would bet that they're going to go Starfall with Tyrande. It does a lot of damage and really zones well on this map. And now with Zul, Tyrande, and Malfurion, they actually have a good lockdown chain. Um, they can do the Bone Prism into the Lunar Flare, into the Entangling Roots, and really lock somebody down for Leeming to blow them up. There's the second frontliner uh, that I thought the Jackson 5 might go with in Sonya. She pairs very well with Diablo, or I'm sorry, with Rhaegar. And uh, the her wave clear on this map is good too. I do think I like the War Boys um, draft a little bit more, and they were very decisive in their picks. They seem to really know what they wanted to do. Their first three picks, actually four picks in particular, I really, really like. Uh, you don't see much of Malfurion in the competitive scene. Um, even in the amateur competitive scene, but I, I have um, seen a couple teams do some kind of different things with him. So I'm curious what the War Boys have in mind for them for their Malfurion. Uh, the the main reason I, I like their draft a little bit more is because of Zul. He is so good on this map. Uh, his wave clear, solo wave clear is unparalleled. He can basically single-handedly push two lanes, and it's just going to put a lot of pressure on. Uh, the Jackson 5. There's going to be a lot of pressure. So here we go. We are going to go to the loading screen now. So let's go ahead and switch to our in-game screen here. <clears throat> Tomb of the Spider Queen is one of the smaller maps. The lanes are very close together. It encourages rotations. Um, and that particular style of gameplay will, I think, favor... Uh, the comp of the War Boys in the early game, simply because Johanna and Zul can just mow through those uh, so fast. Also, this map can be a little bit snowbally. Um, by controlling the turn-ins, you can really, really snowball this map. So if you get first turn-in, get a little bit of a level advantage, and just keep the other team off the turn-in, um, it can be very difficult to come back on this map uh, for this reason. Because when you're holding such a large amount of gems and you're down in level, you have to be really, really careful. Because if your main gem carrier gets gets blown up, it'll set you back so far. So I think it's very important on this map not to fall behind. And if you can get that first turn in before the other team, that's a really big plus. So I think one of the keys to Tomb of the Spider Queen here is going to be... Hey, Flimsy, how you doing, buddy? Uh, one of the keys here... Um, for both teams is going to be keeping vision on the turn. -in. You really want to keep track of uh, what the other team is doing and not let them sneak in any cheap turn-ins if you can avoid it. Okay, so we have the Jackson 5 here as the red team. We have Terra Spaz on Rhaegar, Gumby on Sylvanas, Devorian on Diablo, Silverhawk on Zonia, and McKitten on Jaina. The blue team which will be the War Boys, has Pandy on Johanna, Emerald on uh, Tyrande, Maddie Havoc on Malfurion, Vega on Li Ming, and the Betrayer on Zul. I don't think you're going to see much of a skirmish here in the middle. Actually, the uh, War Boys have already gone off to their lane assignments. Uh, so Sonya a little bit far out, and now she's rooted, and there's the uh, follow-up with the Sonar Flare and the Hunter's Mark. She did take a lot of damage, but the damage from Jane on Rhaegar was able to force them back without her going out. She did overextend a little bit, took a lot of damage, but ended up going okay. We're going to see um, Sylvanas and Zul, I imagine, pair off in this bottom lane. That does definitely favor um, Zul. Let's see what they do with these lane assignments. Yep, they are allowing Zul and Sylvanas to go on the bottom. Sylvanas is slowly going to lose that lane if Betrayer stays down there. You want to keep, make sure you soak every lane. You don't want to lose really one little bit of experience on this because it can make all the difference. Uh, Johanna gets flipped and Diablo is rooted and Lunar flared. Johanna's not really the person you want to flip there. She can really iron shield out of it. 
Sonya is probably the person I would put in that bottom lane um, to try to fight against Zul. Uh, but Sylvanas might be a little safer in that she can keep her distance. As long as she doesn't get rooted, she'll probably be okay. Where Sylvanas has to get in there a little bit more. So both sides currently just skirmishing um, around the center point of the map. Collecting their experience, collecting their gems. Li Ming is in a very advantageous flanking position. She can really throw her damage. She d oh, Sonya's getting on her. Li Ming might be in trouble if Jaina could land the combo, but he missed on the Cone of Cold. Um, Li Ming doesn't have nearly as much wave clear head on, but if she can get into a flanking position, she her wave clear is much better that way with her arcane orb. So a lot of damage dealt out in the top lane. Both sides are forced to tap her well. Um, Zul is kind of hovering between two lanes here. I would really like to see Stool, Zul dedicate himself to this bottom lane and put pressure on this bottom lane. Uh, Sylvanas, if he dedicates himself to it and he plays it right, will not be able to deal with the pressure. Keep your skeletons, push it out, and get rid of the ammo on the turrets. I want to see these blue minions at these towers the whole time. Whereas, so you kind of have Zul and Sylvanas dancing around the middle lane while the other four members are fighting at the top. Diablo may be in trouble, but I don't think there's going to be enough follow-up. Leeming might be able to pick him off. Diablo barely escapes with 140 hit points. Very dangerous. He is going to hearth back, though. So far, it's the War Boys who have managed to sneak in 21 gems. They're about halfway to a turn-in. Jackson 5 is sitting on 33. So Zul, what he's trying to do, the reason his bottom wave isn't always pushed out forward like I'd like to see, is he's pushing his split between bottom and mid lane. Um, these bottom turrets, because of Sylvanas has stayed down here, hasn't lost very much ammunition. Diablo might be in trouble if he can land a stun, and he does. But Leeming isn't down here for the burst damage, so he's going to get away. And Leeming is picked off by Sonya and Jaina. That's pretty big. There's uh, eight gems lost there, um, and now they're a man down. But Zul's push has caused this tamo ammo, tower ammo to be low here. You can see in the mid lane it's about half um, there. You have Jaina and Sonya doing a lot of damage to Johanna. There's the stun and the flip. Johanna pops the iron skin to get away. Diablo gets another stun, and Rhaegar is rooted. Diablo might go down. The Moonfire isn't quite enough, and once again, Diablo escapes by the skin of his teeth. I'm going to pop up the uh, talents there. We, if we get a little low on the action, I'll try to go over them. This map, there's always a lot going on. So uh, Sonya needs to be very careful here. Carrying a lot of gems, you don't want to lose those. It looks like uh, Taronda with two supports is going for an auto attacker build, picking up Season Marksman and Focused Attack. Uh, Malfurion picked up Moonburn for the additional wave clear on uh, this map, which is very good on Tower of Doom. And increased the range of his basic abilities, allowing him to stay more safely in the backline and also extends the range of his roots for a root follow-up. Excellent root by Malfurion, completely zoning Diablo out of his own base, and once again, Diablo escapes with like 200 hit points. That's like the third time Diablo has barely got away. I would really like to see the Jackson 5 force a turn in here. They have it, and the War Boys don't. So I want to see them force their gems in before Jackson 5 has, I'm sorry, before the War Boys have enough. And it looks like Jaina's going to get her 9 turned in. Sonya, this is a good chance, really needs to turn those in. I don't want to see Jaina leave here. I want to see Jaina stay with Sonya and prevent this from happening. Um, they do get the turn in despite that, though. And the first turn in on this map is, is very, very big. Um, on, Johanna takes Knight, takes Palm. Very good on this map. I would have preferred to see Eternal Retaliation here at 4. Um, with all of the minions on this map, that lowers the cooldown on her Condemn, and she can really spam that Condemn on this map and on Infernal Shrines. That's a really good talent here, especially if you take Blessed Momentum. You can just that, that W is always off of cooldown for Johanna. In the middle of all that, Sonya never tapped, got caught out and rooted out and blown up. So this is, without Sonya, one of their primary damage dealers and wave player. You're going to see the Jackson 5 have far less pushing power without her. However, currently the middle middle Spider Queen is pushing um, unimpeded. Lots of damage going out, forcing the Jackson 5 to withdraw. Both teams on one kill. Both teams uh, pretty close to even in level. Jackson 5 is a little bit ahead. 
Zul going with evading all basic attacks. That would not have been my choice here because they really only have one auto attacker in Sonya. I would have gone with the uh, when the bone shield expires, it has a percentage of damage with double tanks, Diablo and Sonya. That could have done a lot of damage. Jailers for extra push and cursed strike attack speed slow. That's really good for Sonya, so I get that pick completely. And now we have the War Boys have cleared up, and they do have enough. See, this is when you want, as to the Jackson 5, you want to keep eyeballs on the turn in. Um, keep them from turning in. If you can get a second turn in on the back of this, um, and they're almost there already. So they, they completely uncontested. You, you, you almost have to keep eyeballs on the turn in at all times. Um, that would have guaranteed, if they could have kept them away from there, uh, Jackson 5 would have guaranteed that they get 10 before their opponents. Li Ming is going with Astral Presence, your mana... On this map, I would have preferred the uh, Power Globes because the lanes are so close together. If you rotate lane to lane, you can almost always have 10% bonus on your ability power because your globes are going for so long. And I think those ability power last for like 10 seconds. It's a pretty long time. Triumvirates are good. This really maximizes your damage and allows you to stay at range. This is a pretty big 5-on-5 five -five battle here before level 10. Uh, Rhaegar is getting rooted, and he is absolutely going to explode. Diablo is very close, as is Sonya. They both need to get back up in a hurry. The Lunar Flare just misses capitalizing, and the Jackson 5 has to, has to retreat. Uh, level 10 has been picked up for uh, the War Boys. You're going to have Twilight Dream instead of... Uh, <clears throat> Twilight Dream instead of Tranquility, so... And Starfall, so neither one of the healers going with their healing ultimates, both of them going with the damage ultimates. Sony gets blown up after being rooted from Malkyrian. Jaina is going to go down by the teleport from Li Ming. The Jackson 5 is really, really on their back foot here. This is the pressure that Zul has, and uh, falling behind and getting their tents first is a big deal. So Starfall on Tyrande, Twilight Dream on Malkyrian, Blessed Shield from Johanna, Poison Nova from Zul, and Disintegrate from Li Ming. On the Jackson 5 side, we have Ancestral Healing from Rhaegar. Up, oh, Sylvanas, you need to back up. She's in a lot of trouble. The Owl just missed. Probably wouldn't have killed her anyway, but... They uh, haven't really been able to group up because they keep having to hearth back with low-life uh, characters. Ancestral Healing on Rhaegar. Wrath of the Berserker on Sonya. Apoc on Diablo. Wailing Arrow on Sylvanas. And Ring of Frost on Jaina. So the best-case scenario in a team fight. Uh, for the Jackson 5 is they want to fight in an area well, that's a little bit smaller so that way the APOC rings all overlap each other and it's difficult for War Boys to get out of it and then you can follow up a good APOC with a really impactful Ring of Frost and a Blizzard on top of that and if you can drop the Wailing Arrow on top of it to boot that's that's the Wombo combo they want to try to set up here. Johanna might be in trouble because Diablo flipped her behind the wall but they do manage to blow up the wall. That's a pretty good ring, but because everybody was so far back, there is just no follow-up. The only thing it does is it serves to deter the War Boys from going further even more. Let's go back to talking about this Leeming build here. I don't like Triumvirate and Calamity together because you've got one talent forcing you to stay away to make full use of it, and another one... Uh, teleport. Sonya is really far out here. If he gets caught in that root or the Lunar Flare, there it is. Sonya is gonna absolutely get blown up here. A good move to try to turn into the crash, but she was too far gone. Jackson 5 really needs to uh, step back, kind of regroup here. They're, they're a little bit all over the place. Regroup and uh, see if they can get some momentum back here. And uh, the War Boys are very... Th there's the turn and they're very, very close. So Rhaegar, it looks like, went a Lightning Shield build. Um, I'm going to go over the particulars of this build uh, at the end. Diablo gets a good Ancestral Heal. is going to keep Diablo alive for the time being, but they're, they, being the War Boys, are, are using a really nice job of coordinating their roots and their stuns on top of each other. So far, we have seen um, Apoc and Wailing Arrow and Ring of Frost used, but they've been used very disjointedly. I would, I, that's a really good Ring of Frost, set up basically by nothing, but their team was so low on life when they dove in to follow up on it. Um, uh, look, at, 
Uh, there goes Rhaegar. So three members of the War Boys down, two members of the Jackson Five down. With Jackson Five, oh, there you go. Nice follow up by Johanna. She might be able to get the team wipe. It's going to be close. Johanna is pretty tough to bring down. Even still, four on two. That's really big for Jackson Five. They needed that. However, they need to get back and kill these Web Weavers because they're pushing on the keeps and the forts. What I would really like to see from Jackson Five is them to coordinate their Wailing Arrow, their Ring of Frost, and their APOC. If they can do that in the early part of a fight, not necessarily to initiate it, but right as the fight is clearly becoming a hard engagement, if they can land... Yeah, he really has been, Flimsy. If they can land all three of those together, they, they, will, they can wipe uh, the War Boys, and, and that's the combo they need right there. They want an APOC, Ring of Frost, Wailing Arrow in conjunction, and all of them landing. If uh, Jackson 5 need to get Diablo turned in, he has 32 coins, and they should do it now. They see them down here. They know where the War Boys are, and that's exactly what Jackson 5 is doing. They're coming here. To Li Ming is going to come to turret. They should jump on her. They know the t their teammates are at the bottom, so get, get her back. Good zoning. There you go. Get her out of there. Good zoning by Jackson 5. It might be a little too little too late. Diablo does get his 32 in, but we have a hard team engagement here. The Ancestral keeps Sonya up, but right in the middle of the zone fall, it just wasn't enough. Now, we did see Wailing Arrow and Ring of Frost together there, uh, but the damage dealer Sonya and, and Jaina were both already dead. There was no follow-up on it. What those will probably do is if Diablo and Sylvanas get out alive, it'll be because of that. And there's the APOC again by itself. It just didn't accomplish a lot. So I would really like to see more coordination out of the ultimates from the Jackson 5 here. They did get the turn in, but lost four members of the team in the process. So they're not going to get a whole lot of mileage out of these web weavers pushing down the lanes. Yeah, War Boys have been a little bit more cohesive this game. Um, I think part of that is their comp with the uh, uh, Lunar Flare and the Entangling Roots and the Bone Prism is um, a little more straightforward to, to land, to lock somebody down and let Leeming blow them up. So that's a little easier to coordinate. I think the comp that the Jackson 5 had, hey, good isolation. That's a nice job by Tiablo to completely isolate Leeming. That's a really good pickoff. Uh, but the comp that that the Jackson 5 have has is a little bit harder to isolate. They really only have the roots from Diablo. They have slows from Jaina and Rhaegar, but those are a little bit hard to do. So it's a pretty hard fight here. This is a five on four. Good start. That was a good Wailing Arrow. And there, see, there it is. There's the Wailing Arrow and the Ring of Frost. If Diablo had his APOC up, he would have caught him. All of the members who were caught in that Ring of Frost, and that would have been two more members of Jackson 5 down. I really want to see Diablo hold on to his APOC until those other two are up. If APOC was up there, that would have been three or four members of War Boys down. Um, there was good coordination with the Wailing Arrow and the Ring of Frost, but when the Ring of Frost was hit with the APOC on top of it, as soon as the Ring of Frost hits, you pop APOC, you're going to catch everybody who is in the Ring of Frost, you're going to catch them in the APOC as well. A talent tier down by the Jackson 5, and it looks like it looks like War Boys are going to go for boss. This is a little bit aggressive. Uh, however, Jackson 5 hasn't sniffed it out yet, and they're going to be there. It looks like they're coming now, but it's going to be too late. The War Boys are going to have this boss by the time they get here. Please, Diablo, don't use APOC. Save it. Save it. Now back up, Jackson 5. There you go. So now you want to back up and defend at your keep. You're a talent tier down, and... Uh, the War Boys have turn in. Uh, so this is going to be a bad news for the Jackson 5. A turn in, talent to your advantage, and a boss all going in favor of the War Boys. This front wall is going to go down. This fountain is probably going to go down as well. The keep, I'm sure, will stay up, but it's going to take a little bit of damage from the boss. Looks like the War Boys is advancing currently, but without Zul. They want to be careful. They don't want to jump into a 5-on-4 situation here without Zul. I don't like... The War Boys engaging here if they do without two members of their team. There you go. That's not an engagement you want to take five on three because that gives the lower talent tier team an opportunity to catch up. Nice uh, combo landed there by Leeming. Tony getting chunked down a little bit here. 
Now Jackson 5 have the unfortunate decision to make of defending from the five-man push or going down and taking out the uh, spiders. Sonya gets rooted. Oh, that's an excellent wailing arrow. There's the Ring of Frost. I want to see the APOC now with it. All three of them together. There, there, there have been a lot of missed opportunities for Jackson 5 here that both this team fight and the last one could have gone way better if they coordinated their ults and both would have been wins if they coordinated their ults. Um, Jaina and uh, Sylvana seem to be doing a really nice job of uh, coordinating their two ults. We just haven't seen the APOC get in there. Gumby and Silverhawk really working those two together well the last half of this game. Diablo is too far forward without his team. He needs to back up. Jackson 5 is really on their back foot. They have, they're going to have Merce, or I'm sorry, Catapults pushing. Diablo, you're not going to be able to save it, and that, that was an overextension. That was a mistake by Diablo. He wasn't going to be able to save that keep, and now he opened up a possible win condition um, for the War Boys. So the War Boys in really strong control of this game. They have both Catapults coming down both the top lanes and the mid lanes, and all of their forts are still up and going. So this, so far, a pretty... A pretty dominant performance for the War Boys thus far. Um, and I, I really think it's been missed opportunities for Jackson 5. Um, they've been in position to win these team fights, but they just haven't capitalized on them. And uh, if they get that coordination down, they're in the right spots to succeed. They're just not taking full advantage of them. Both teams rotating down to the Siege Giants in the bottom. Um, uh, if the. Uh, Jackson 5's take this. They've got a 5 on 2 here, but 5 on 3 with Leaning coming. Be aggressive or get out of there. Don't uh, don't just stand around. You're inviting a chance to get jumped. So they do steal the Siege Giants and back up. Well played. When you're down 20 to 17, you don't want to stick around too long because it's just inviting the other team to come down and get you. So get in there and bully them out of the Siege Camps or just get out of there. One of the things that gets overlooked, and uh, Sonya is really far out here. Uh, one of the things I think that can get overlooked... In, in Heroes, um, and that my team, we had to focus on a lot in the beginning because we did it. Sylvanas gets absolutely isolated and blown up. Great Starfall. There goes Rhaegar. There goes Diablo. And this uh, should be game. Uh, Warboy should capitalize on this. They don't even need to go through the keep. They need to go around. There you go. Go around it. Go straight down the open lane and go right to the core. Warboys is going to win this on a, a pretty dominant performance here. Barring a miracle from Jaina. What I started to say, one of the overlooked aspects of Heroes of the Storm is vision is so important. And I think uh, when you're trying to improve on the team as a team, that's one of the things you can really work on is don't let the other team know where you're at if you can avoid it. If you can take an extra second to get to where you're going, but you stay out of sight of the enemy team, sight is so, so important. Really, really good showing there by the War Boys. They are now 2-5 and five on the season. And Jackson 5... Uh, struggling a little bit that game. They fall to 2 and 6 on the season. Uh, most of these heroes I'm pretty familiar with, so I'll go over the talents uh, here. Uh, the talent builds here. Let's Actually, let's look at the stats first. First of all, 20 to 6 kills is, is obviously part of the game. Uh, Jackson 5 just never quite seemed to get on their footing in their team fights. They had a couple of really good opportunities, and they could just never quite quite put it away or never land the, the impactful abilities that they needed to turn it in their favor. The last, um, not the last one that ended the game, but the two team fights in before that, Jackson 5 was right there. They could have won those team fights with a little more coordination with their ultimates. And when you guys go back and view the replay, look at those situations. I think that's the area that you could have improved. And both of those team fights could have completely flipped this game around. So you guys were in the right situations. You just weren't able to capitalize on it. War Boys had really good coordination here. And I really liked how you um, staggered your lockdowns. You would put the Bone Prism, followed by the Lunar Flare, followed by the Entangling Roots. And with Leeming blowing you down, you, you were able to blow up heroes right away and start good five-on-four engagements. Really impressive coordination on your uh, crowd control chains. I mean, uh, look at the damage from Leeming. She's really taking advantage of her teams locking people up for her. 70,000 damage. That's uh, more than, oh, almost, uh, wow, 42,000 siege damage, second, or uh, hero damage from Tehran, second on the team. That's really impressive as well. I play a lot of Tehran. Um, and and she's 
she can do some damage, but you don't usually see that. She's actually second highest in the game. So that's really impressive from Emerald on Tyrande. And we talked about before the game, during the draft. Uh, yes, Emerald, if you go to my Twitch channel, uh, it will be there in past broadcast once I end this. Uh, we talked about Zul's push. And you can see the push power, the 152,000 siege damage and the 14,000 experience, both tops, um, tops on the team and tops in the game. So let's go take a look at these talents. So I uh, here's the way, when I do choose to go over talent builds, I only go over the characters that I'm, I'm familiar with that I play a lot um, because I don't want to maybe criticize or offer suggestions uh, to a character that I'm not familiar with because that doesn't do anybody any good. Uh, I am familiar with a lot of the characters in these games or on this team. Uh, starting with Tehran. So Tehran went with a uh, kind of an auto attack build here. This isn't one you see uh, too much at 13, uh, primarily because, well, let's start at the beginning. Okay, so Season Marksman and Focused Attack, good synergy together. If you're going to get one, you should get the other a lot most of the time on any character that has them. And whenever you're building your character, that's what you're looking for in your talents. You want them to synergize with one another. Um, I, What I would have liked to have seen here is the extended range on the Lunar Flare, because Malfurion went extended range um, here. So they could have actually reached pretty far out together and gone further out than normal. Um, but Lunar Momentum is fine too. If you have a double support with Tyrande, Starfall is so good right now. You, it's hard to do it when you're a solo support Tehran, but Starfall is so, so good right now. If you're going to double support comp with Tehranda, um, Starfall is absolutely the way to go. And that's where a lot of... We were talking about her damage a minute ago. This is where a lot of her damage came from. It's really, really good. Um, 13, if you're a solo build Tehran, you go with the increased healing. Always. There's never under any circumstance. Um... That you wouldn't use it. I haven't seen this too much, but it does make sense with what Emerald's trying to do because we talked about synergy before. So if you mark your target and you're getting 40% attack speed and you're getting your focused attack and season marksman, those three are synergizing well. So that's your auto attack build there. True shot aura. I don't think this was the right um, call because there's, other than Zul a little bit, there's no other auto attackers really on the team. So you're not going to get a lot of um, mileage out of that one. Um, and Nexus Frenzy with the auto attack build. So I really like 1, 4, 13, and 20. Those all synergize really, really well. The changes I would make if I was playing this build is I would have done the extended range at 7 and the um, extra damage and extra mana re return on the Lunar Flare at 16 because you'd have those two synergize really well. And then that extra range would have gone well with Malfurion's um, extra range on his basic attack. So the 16 is the really only one I have a, a, an issue with just because I don't think you're going to get much out of it uh, because there's no really other auto attackers on the team to do so. I'm going to briefly go over Malfurion just to see what he's trying to do. I'm not going to suggest improvements because I don't play Malfurion enough to do that. This talent makes perfect sense on Tomb of the Spider Queen where there are so many minions and wave clear is so prevalent. This is a good choice. And I like this as well because Malfurion's range on his stuff is a little short. so. Um, this is a talent that I like as well. Uh, this isn't you don't you don't hardly ever see Twilight Dream. It's really fun when you do, um, and it's hard to criticize any of their old selections because you guys their coordination was really good from the War Boys, um, and obviously, um, I think at level ten maybe they they realized they felt they wouldn't need the extra healing, so they went all out with the uh, damage and utility builds, and Full Moon Fire, along with Moonburn. These two synergize really well and are really good on Tomb um, for the reason we talked about. There's so many minions, wave clear, so prevalent. Uh, so this is a little bit of a Moonfire build here too. And there, you know, with and with uh, Starfall and uh, the Roots and the Stuns and you know Johanna's Blessed Shield, there was really a lot of crowd control on the side of the War Boys. Uh, I like this uh, synergy between 13, 16, and one here. And really going all in with the uh, Twilight Dream. You know, at this point, why they picked 20s, the game was kind of over, so it didn't really matter so much. Johanna, one of my most favorite 
one of my most played heroes and one of my most favorite heroes. Knight Takes Pawn uh, is almost always the pick, especially on Tomb of the Spider Queen. It's the pick to make. At four, I take Laws of Hope on almost every map except for two. And those two maps are Tomb of the Spider Queen and Infernal Shrines. On those maps where you have to kill, on this map where there's more minions and on Infernal Shrines where you have the little Shrine Guardians, I prefer to take Eternal Retaliation. It lowers the cooldown uh, <clears throat> on your Condemn. So you have Condemn and or you have Eternal Retaliation and Knight Takes Pawn going together. You can spam your W almost if you catch a lot of the minions in it. And it increases her wave clear so much, especially when you stack Blessed Momentum on it. I mean, you can do it so much that mana actually becomes a problem. So this is my, my selection generally, except for Tomb of the Spider Queen and Infernal Shrines. Um, I would suggest those of you that play Johanna, and if you haven't given that talent a try yet, do so on those two maps, and I think you won't go back. It's really, really good um, when you're trying to add wave clear or clear out the Shrine Guardians. Um, but in my opinion, Blessed Shield is always the way to go, especially in a competitive scene. Falling Sword is fine. My problem with it, especially in a comp like this, is Johanna is the main tank, and if you take Falling Sword... You jump up in the air, and now your tank is gone. So you, your tank is off the map for a few seconds. Your job is to be there and take damage. So Blessed Shield, to me, is always the way to go. Excellent selection. Uh, Burning Rage is, is always good, uh, where especially here in the front, they had you know one, two, three melee characters. Um, also, when you have Eternal Retaliation on this, you're drawing people to you all the time, which gets you even more damage out of Burning Rage. Um, imposing Presence uh, does make sense with uh, the fact that you're probably going to be fighting Sonya a lot, so it slows her basic attacks a little bit. And if you, but other than that, there really weren't any auto attackers to uh, to go from. So, and at 20, always indestructible. If you're Johanna, you should always be taking indestructible at level 20, in my opinion. There's, I don't see any reason to ever take anything else. It's so good. But like I said, at level 20 at this point, the game was over. I'm not much of a Zool player. The only thing I will say is uh, evading basic attacks. There was only one basic attacker over here. It's Sonya. I would have preferred the uh, bone armor that does the bonus. Uh, I, was like, I think it's 15% uh, bonus health damage on the opposition when it explodes. With double tank, Sonya and Diablo, that talent would have absolutely done work. So I think that would have been a better selection at one. This is really good for Sonya. Uh, Poison Nova is always good. Uh, adding more slows. Really, this, this, the, 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 all of these team builds synergize nicely, and that you guys, I don't know if it was intentional or not, but you guys really focused in on slows, um, talenting into slows. So there were a lot of slows on the team, um, and, it, and it showed. There was so much CC. So if that was intentional, well done. If it was unintentional, also well done. But all of the slows on the team make for really good team synergy. And the... Uh, this, I think this is a must pick with the Li Ming on your team because Li Ming is waiting for you to drop that bone prism down and then she, then you're vulnerable to Li Ming's damage. She already does so much damage as is when you add in the bonus damage to it. Um, it's just really crazy. So I, I think Amplify Damage you should always be taking if you have a Li Ming on your team and uh, Bone Spear is, is always good as well. Um, it's harder to use. I think Bone Spear is generally the way to go. But you could al also consider... Um, the, what's it called, the mortal something, the one that lowers healing by 75% for four seconds or whatever. If you want to get really cute with it, you can try to figure out who Rhaegar is going to ancestral heal, and you drop that on him, and it basically totally negates ancestral heal. Um, I've seen it used a couple times, and it's really good when it works, but it's hard to do. Like I said, at this, ga and at this game in particular, when level 20 rolled around, it was already over, so it didn't matter so much. But uh, Zul players, if you want to mess with that talent when there's a Rhaegar on the other team, if you can guess who he's going to Ancestral Heal and drop that less healing on him, it does a lot of work. Um, Leeming, I would have preferred the Globe talent here just because the lanes are so close. You could gather Globes. You could basically permanently have um, an ability damage increase. I do like Triumvirate, and I do like Calamity, but I don't like them together in the same build because Triumvirate is forcing you to stay further back to get full use out of it, and Calamity is forcing you to get in close to get full use out of it. So you've got talents um, kind of pulling you in two different directions. I personally prefer more synergy. Now you can look at it from the perspective of, well, now I have a talent for when I'm far away and a talent for when I'm close. I personally prefer to kind of stick with one build that synergizes well together. So I would have preferred... Um, I think it's 
seven that has the seeker, especially if you're gonna go mirror ball. So I think it's seven that has the seeker when three magic missiles hit you do bonus damage, and that goes so well with mirror ball. I think if you're gonna pick up mirror ball, you have to do the bonus damage at seven with the three missiles, and that would have gone so well with Triumvirate, especially with the, so Zul locks down the bone prism with the vulnerable. You hit your W, and five lasers on him with the bonus damage would have been so good. So I don't particularly like that level seven pick for that reason. Disintegrate, glass cannon, absolutely. This would have been my exact build if I were playing Leeming in this game, except for at seven, I would have picked um, picked the uh, uh, extra damage when the three hits. Now maybe he was going for um, extra wave clear because the teleport has probably, the teleporting damage it's probably Li Ming's best wave clear. So that makes sense, but you already have so much wave clear on your team. You had Malfurion built for wave clear. Johanna is the best wave clearing tank in the game. Zul is the best wave clearing hero in the game. So the team already had good wave clear. I would have gone with a different talent here at seven. Otherwise, this is an excellent build. Rhaegar, also one of my uh, more played heroes on the leftovers. I am the support player and I play Rhaegar a lot. When Rhaegar first got his rework, his lightning shield was hands down the way to go. I don't use it um, as much. Uh, I, I, the lightning bond on the first level uh, is good because you had two tanks and it gives you extra wave clear, so that's nice. I just, is a preference, that I don't think there's anything wrong with this talent. My preference is always to get the increase uh, totem range at one and then the slow on 16, because that 90% slow is really, really good. At four, this is a really good ability, but I don't think it's nearly as good on these smaller maps because you're just not in wolf time, wolf form nearly as much. So you're not getting full use out of it. Um, I'm gonna have to look at his level, what his level four talents. Um, I'm lately I've been going with the. Um, Healing Totem, because uh, Rhaegar's Healing Totem has the shortest cooldown of any of the Healing Totems. You can use it 30 seconds instead of 60 seconds. So that, that's what I've been going lately. I wouldn't go Feral Heart on the small maps. I do pick it a lot on the larger maps, because you can stay in Wolf form more and, and maximize the advantage, the advantage you get out of it. This is uh, an ability I almost never pick, and I think this was a really big mistake here at seven. I'm not gonna pick on you, Terra Spaz, but I'm gonna pick on you a little bit. When you have Zul on the other team, the Bone Prism is a giant bullseye to throw a cleanse on it. Cleanse is really hard to use, um, and I had to force myself into learning how to use it, but Zul is the easiest character to use it against. You absolutely had to get cleanse here. You see the Bone Prism coming from a mile away, there's a giant, broadcast to it before it hits, have your cleanse ready to go. Especially with this much lockdown on a Leeming, you really needed to have cleanse here at level seven. Ancestral healing, really the way to go. And I saw at least two really clutch ancestral heals from him. At 13 with this particular comp, um, this is a good one too, but with two melee her her heroes, uh, and including yourself, and you're always gonna be close together. And this map, you tend to have kind of close fights anyway. I would have gone with the uh, cooldown reduction on the uh, chain heal uh, for every person that you hit with it. And then I would have paired it with, um, if you didn't go healing totem, the decreased in mana cost here. So you go decreased mana cost at four, and decrease in cooldown based on how many you hit with it. You've got two melee characters. They should theoretically be allowed around each other a little more. And remember, when you do that chain heal, it counts you too. So you can kind of bridge your teammates and really make sure you're hitting two or three with that chain heal at a time. You get maximum mana usage with your decreased mana here at four, and you get maximum cooldown reduction with your talent at 13. Now the other good one here at 13, which would have been really good uh, with your particular team is the Lightning Shield. It's a percentage-based uh, ability. Diablo has one of the largest health pools in the game. You could have given him 15% extra health every time your W was up. So I, I think of the abilities here, this was uh, would have been my last choice. And 16, I, I just, the slow is so good on the totem. I can't not do the slow. It's a really good disengage tool. Your team is running away, you're on the retreat, you throw it down behind you, and the whole enemy team is just dead stopped. I, I can't foresee any situation in which I would not pick the totem slow. It's just too good. 
Um, I am not going to comment on the Sonya. I don't play Sonya, and the few times I have, I'm terrible with her. If uh, my boy Flimsy were still in the chat, he could, I'm sure, speak to it. I'm not going to. Uh, Diablo I play a little bit. I'm going to see if anything jumps out to me. Okay, so the build here, if you pick this Devil's Do here, you're basically making a build where you want to, you know, you're constantly respawning. Um, and I, if you're going to do this, I forget, I don't see that you picked it. I think if you're going to pick Devil's Do, you should actually pick the talent, and I don't remember what tier it's at. Um, maybe four, but the talent that passively spawns souls, because you want to make maximum use out of this, right? This lets you go ham. As soon as you get 60, you go crazy. Um, and then at, if should you have gotten to 20, you use the APOC on death. So you initiate hard, you pop your APOC in the beginning, you go crazy, you die, you get a second APOC, and then you spawn right away. That's a perfectly viable uh, Diablo build, and I think it's one of the most fun ones to do because you can just go crazy uh, once you get your 60 soul stones. So I think if you're going to pick Devil's Due, you need to pick the talent that lets you passively generate soul stones. Synergizes really well with this. Um, and I think Doravan, when you, if you guys, I hope you guys go back and review this film as a team. Um, if you guys would have synergized these three ultimates, and I know you've heard it, me saying it multiple times now, but these three go really well together, and you landed a couple of good Wailing Arrows and Ring of Frost together, if you would have had an APOC on top of that, it would have made a world of difference. Uh, Sylvanas' build. Range. This is an excellent pick on Tomb of the Spider Queen. Absolutely excellent pick. And Gumby landed a number of really good Wailing Arrows. That was really very impressive. Uh, this is a must pick as well, the extra damage. I think at this point you guys are really on your back foot. Jaina, also one of my most played heroes. This deep chill when it was 35% instead of 25% was absolutely the best talent on the tier. Now I think it's kind of the worst. Um, I usually end up picking either uh, Conjurer's Pursuit or the increase of the duration of the chill. Um, Jaina can have mana issues, that's why you go Conjurer's Pursuit. The reason I go to increase the duration is what it does is it allows you to use your Q. You, you can initiate with your Q, and your Q will be off of cooldown um, before the chill ends. So your chill goes from 4 seconds to 6 seconds, and your Q is on a 4 second cooldown. So if I'll be in lane with the tank, I'll actually plink him repeatedly with the Q, and you wear them down pretty fast. So those are the two I go with at first level. It's either Conjurer's Pursuit or the increasing the duration of the chill from 4 seconds to 6 seconds. Um, I used to take Arcane Intellect a lot, and I really liked it. Um, I got away from it because I, I think it, get, it was a crutch for me to not manage my mana better and when I learned to manage my mana better I got away from it. I do pick it occasionally and I'll tell you when I do um, but the increase of the blizzard on this map especially is so good. That bigger blizzard allows you to zone out the enemy, kill entire minion waves uh, and, and it's, it's, it's absolutely the way to go. So I've gotten away from Arcane Intellect. Also on this map that's a little bit smaller you're never really far from a well if they're not destroyed. So I think I would have gone with the increased uh, radius of the blizzard for that reason. Now I will tell you when I do take Arcane Intellect is I take Arcane Intellect on um, Battlefield of Eternity sometimes if I'm on Jaina because it allows you to just spam your spells on the Immortal and not run out of mana. So that's really the map I take it on, is Battlefield of Eternity for that reason. Uh, this is the talent to go to at 7. Uh, the other one I consider at 7 is the cooldown reduction on the Q. And I do that especially on Battlefield of Eternity. Uh, but generally I take Frostbitten. I think that's kind of the typical Jaina build right now, is Conjurer's Pursuit or Lingering Chill, uh, the increased radius of the Blizzard, and Frostbitten. Uh, Silverhawk, you landed a number of really good Ring of Frost, and you did it without a lot of setup, which is really tough to do. I actually thought your Ring of Frost um, usage was really impressive. Um, unfortunately, a lot of times uh, when you land them, your team just wasn't in a very good position to follow up, so you never really got a really decisive team fight win from your usage of it, but your Ring of Frost usage was really, really good. I haven't played with Ice Barrier too much, um, but I don't particularly like it when I have used it. And it's for a similar reason that I don't like the mana Arcane Intellect, is I feel like it's a little bit of a crutch for being in a bad situation. 
I prefer, I think it's called Icy Flows. It's the one where you activate it and you get bonus ability power and uh, cooldown or, or reduced by 50% for five seconds or whatever it is. <laughs> the reason I prefer that one is if you activate it right when you start your combo, because Jaina is all about burst combo, right? So um, when I play her, I usually EWQ later in the game. Because this is why you have your E for vulnerable, right? So you E to make them vulnerable. You want to at least hit them with the first wave of Blizzard. If you hit them with the second wave, great. And by the way, it's easier to hit them with the second rate wave if you have the increased radius on it. So I'll hit my one to activate Icy Flows. I will use E for Northern Exposure. Drop your Blizzard on them and start plinking them with my Q. Normally when you play Janna, you use your combo and you're kind of like, I'm done for the next 10 seconds. You kind of can't do much, but if you have Icy Flows, you actually get to use your combo twice before you're done and have to back up and wait. Because with Jaina, especially once she uses her Blizzard, it's on such a long cooldown, you have kind of one shot to make a really impactful play.